Hello, and welcome back to the second part of a three-part lecture series over histology, which is the study of tissues. My name is Matthew Belzer. I'm going to be your instructor, and if you're watching this, you're probably a student at ACC. Now, if you are a student at ACC, what I would do before you even begin this particular lecture is I'd have your handout up and available to you, or I would print it out so you can write out your notes by hand as we go through the lecture today. As always, I've provided you with a set of learning objectives, and I haven't made these complex learning objectives because it's kind of to the point with tissue histology. People tend to do really well on the histology portion of the exam because it's very visual. It's kind of intuitive when you start looking at these tissues. So I want you to be able to describe the general characteristics shared by most connective tissues. I want you to be able to recognize the specific tissues we go over, given a histological image or a written description. And I want you to be able to describe the structure, location, and function of different connective tissues that we discuss in the class today. Now, when you think about connective tissue, connective tissue is sometimes described in textbooks as being like the packaging material of the body. It's the most abundant and most diverse of the tissues that we're going to go over, of the primary or basic tissue types that we go over, meaning there are a lot of different subclassifications within the umbrella of connective tissue, and it essentially links all of these things together in our body and serves this really wide array of functional roles. And we're going to talk about the specific functions as we get to um, each of the uh, connective tissues that you need to know for this class. Now, Unlike epithelial tissue, so if you remember, epithelial tissue displays this uh, physical feature called cellularity, meaning that the cells are really close to one another, in fact so close that one cell attaches to the adjacent cell or the neighboring cell via these things called junctions, and most of the tissue is made up of cells. Connective tissue doesn't have that particular structural trend or pattern. Connective tissue, on the other hand, is made up predominantly of what's called extracellular matrix. That's what makes up most of the tissue. So in connective tissue, you have these really widely spaced cells or relatively widely spaced cells. And the gap in between those cells, what's filling in the gap in between those cells is this stuff called the extracellular matrix. It's kind of like fruit jello. The pieces of fruit are kind of like the cells, and then the jello is kind of like the extracellular matrix. Most connective tissues, with the exception of cartilage and dense regular connective tissue, tend to be vascular, meaning that they have blood vessels that run through them, and those blood vessels that run through them, these dense vascular networks, provide nutrients, etc., to different tissues in the body. Notably, things like epithelial tissue, because they're avascular, epithelial tissues are avascular, they have to have a mechanism to get nutrients and get rid of wastes, so that's the underlining connective tissue that allows that to happen. So connective tissue, unlike epithelial tissue, tends to be highly vascular. So if I'm asking you like a compare and contrast question of the general characteristics between epithelial and connective tissue, right? Connective tissue is structured a lot differently than epithelial tissue. Now, when I talk about the extracellular matrix, there are two primary ingredients to the extracellular matrix. So let's say we were baking an extracellular matrix cake. The first ingredient is called ground substance. Now, there are different types of ground substance. Glycosaminoglycans, or GAGs, are an example of that. Probably won't have you write that out on an exam. I'm just going to have you put ground substance. And in general terms, ground substance is kind of like jello mix, right? It's a, if I'm drawing a molecular analogy, ground substance is like jello mix. So if you took a teaspoon of jello mix and you put it into a gallon of water, you mixed it up, put it in the fridge, and then you pulled it out a day later, you'd have some jello, but it would be, have a really watery consistency, right? It wouldn't be a very solid jello because you didn't put very much jello mix in it. On the flip token, if you took six cups of jello mix, put it into a gallon of water, mixed it up, and put it in the fridge, when you pulled it out a day later, you would have a jello with a really kind of defined, harder consistency. It'd take on a defined three dimensional shape and have these kind of solid like properties. And ground substance does the same. The more ground substance there is in the extracellular matrix of a connective tissue, that influences the characteristics of the tissues, right? Protein fibers, on the other hand, are these defined fibers that run through, right, that kind of jello mix. 
And there are different types of protein fibers. We have collagen fibers, which are thick, strong fibers, ounce for ounce. They're stronger or have more tensile strength than titanium. We have elastic fibers, which are these thin black fibers that are capable of stretching and returning to their original shape. We have reticular fibers, which have kind of an intermediate thickness, and they form these, you know, interconnected networks throughout tissues, right, which stabilize the internal components or provide a scaffolding for things like soft organs, such as your spleen or your lymph nodes. So we're going to look at the ECM characteristics of each of the tissues we go over, but if I was to ask you, describe some of the general characteristics shared by most connective tissues and describe the chemical composition of the extracellular matrix, that's kind of where we're on follow along one here. Now, when I draw the analogy, again, I want to highlight this so you guys kind of understand what's happening. If someone gives you fruit jello, it tells you two things. The first thing is, is that person probably doesn't like you very much because you don't give fruit jello to another human being you like. The second thing is that it's a good analogy for connective tissue. So you have your pieces of fruit and they're separated from one another. They're not physically connected to one another. They're independent entities. And the fruit is kind of like the cells in connective tissue, right? So you have the cells in the connective tissue, but most of the tissue isn't made up from the cells. It's made up from the stuff called extracellular matrix and the jello component of this fruit jello is kind of like the extracellular matrix, the area in which the cells sit. So most of the tissue isn't made up of the cells, it's made up of the extracellular matrix. In fact, where do we get jello mix from? We boil down the connective tissue of animals and we use their extracellular matrix components. Now, these are the different types of connective tissues you need to know. They're broken into different uh, subgroupings. So you have the primary tissue type, which is connective tissue, then the subgroups, which are like loose, dense cartilage, bone, and blood connective tissue. But what I'm going to be asking for are, when I'm asking to identify the tissue on the image, I'm going to be asking for the specific tissue types. So we're going to go over the specific tissue types that fall into each subcategory of connective tissue. Now, when you think about loose connective tissue, loose connective tissue has a malleable extracellular matrix that can be distorted, sometimes stretch, and it's called loose because it doesn't take on a really hard or defined extracellular matrix. It has kind of a malleable um, extracellular matrix, meaning it can be stretched and pulled and tugged and distorted, unlike bone, which has kind of a hard extracellular matrix, right? It's not easily distorted. So we group all the tissues, the connective tissues that meet those general characteristics into these three, into this loose connective tissue category of which there are three specific tissue types you need to know. Now you can go through on the PowerPoint and read through these. What we're going to do is we're going to start looking at these and thinking about questions that could be asked. So the first specific type of connective tissue you need to know. And if you get a question that says ID the tissue indicated by the image, it's not just connective tissue, it's a specific type of connective tissue that I'm looking for. If I'm asking you just for connective tissue, the question will read identify the primary slash basic tissue. Anything that says other than that, like identify the tissue indicated by the pointer, I'm not asking for the primary or basic tissue type, I'm asking for the specific tissue types. So. When we look at connective tissue, under the category of loose connective tissue, the first type of loose connective tissue I want you to know is areolar connective tissue. And when you look at areolar connective tissue, you have a bunch of protein fibers running in random directions. That's actually important because that imparts tensile strength or you can pull on that tissue from multiple different directions and it can withstand those pulling forces. And it has these interspersed cells throughout it. Notice that here we have a cell, here we have a cell, and those cells aren't connected to one another. In fact, most of the tissue is made up of this stuff out here called the extracellular matrix. Now, when you're going through this, tissue recognition is an important component of this exam. So you're going to have to develop your own mechanisms or methods of recognizing tissues. Now, let's start thinking about the questions that could be asked. So if I gave you a question in which I said, a form of loose connective tissue in which protein fibers run in multiple directions with interspersed fibroblasts, 
that would be that would be areolar connective tissue. Where do you find areolar connective tissue? Well, you find it in the superficial layer of the dermis. So the epidermis is made up of keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, and then the superficial layer of the dermis, which is made up of connective tissue, that's a layer of skin. Part of that dermis is made up of areolar connective tissue, and that's called the papillary layer of the dermis. So you find areolar connective tissue within the dermis of the skin. And when you think about the ability of the skin to kind of stretch and then return back to its initial shape, that's a consequence of the tissue that underlies the epidermis within the dermis, right, which is areolar connective tissue. So now if I was to ask you specific questions about this, let's go over some specific questions. And this is important because I'm going to start introducing you to the different cell types you find in these tissues. So identify the specific tissue indicated by the pointer or the tissue indicated by the pointer and tell me where you'd find it in the body. So we know that. You also find it in structures that surround like muscles um, and nervous tissue, but we won't get into that right now. We'll talk about that when we get to those specific sections. So if I said that, you would answer areolar or connective tissue. If I said identify the structure indicated by one, all of these big thick fibers you see running through the extracellular matrix that stain a little bit lighter, those are collagen fibers. Collagen fibers are tough. They prevent the tissue from tearing. If I said identify the structure indicated by two, note that I'm saying structure, not tissue. That structure indicated by two in all of these thin black structures within that, within that image are elastic fibers. What these elastic fibers do is they stretch and they return to their original shape. So when you look at the skin distort here and you see it kind of pop back to its initial shape, those are the elastic fibers embedded in the dermis of your skin, specifically within the areolar connective tissue. Cell types that I want you to be familiar with, all of these little black cells you see right here, these dots represent, or don't represent, they are cells. And notice that they're interspersed in most of the tissue's extracellular matrix. These cells, the first type of cell I want you to know is called a fibroblast. Fibroblasts are really important and you find them in all connective tissue because they make extracellular matrix, meaning they make the most abundant component of the tissue. Without fibroblasts, you don't have your tissue. I'll say that again. Fibroblasts make extracellular matrix and they're found in every type of connective tissue. They are extraordinarily important cell type. Now, migrating through this uh, areolar connective tissue are these inflammatory cells called mast cells. And what mast cells do is they release inflammatory compounds, specifically histamine that has a cascading effect, and we won't talk about inflammation right now. And those histamine granules stain kind of red, and you can kind of see these mast cells, and they migrate through, uh, evaluate for immune threats, and if there's an immune threat detected, they'll release that histamine, they'll produce inflammation, so other things like white blood cells can come over to the tissue and do their work. So... Identify the specific tissue indicated by the pointer. Tell me where you'd find it. Identify the structures. Identify the cell types. Think about the difference in the way that those questions are being asked. And I give you a few of them on the handout that you have. So if we were to look at this, like let's say this is practical time or exam time. Let's say identify the tissue indicated by the pointer. That's areolar connective tissue. How do you know? You have these protein fibers running in random directions in order to impart pull or tensile strength for multiple um, points of pull. When you look at the tissue, you have collagen and elastic fibers. You also have <coughs> these interspersed fibroblasts. So let's think about follow-up questions. Identify the cell type indicated by the pointer. If I ask you for a cell type and you say areolar connective tissue, I'm going to mark the question wrong because a tissue is a group of cells coming together and working together to carry out a common set of functions, but a cell type, I'm asking you, what's the cell? Identify the type of cell within the tissue. So those are fibroblasts. Fibroblasts are important because they make extracellular matrix. Identify the structure. That's a collagen fiber. What's its function? It's a thick, strong fiber. Ounce for ounce has more tensile strength than titanium. Identify these fibers right here, right? 
or structures here, those are elastic fibers. And what do they do? They stretch and then they're capable of bloop, kind of booing back or returning back to their original shape. So they impart elasticity characteristics to the tissue. Where do you find this? You find it in the superficial layer of the dermis or the papillary layer of the dermis. And you may as well know that term because in the next section, we're going to start talking about the integument right off the bat. Adipose connective tissue. So adipose connective tissue is also called fat. When you give me an answer, you can say adipose CT to shorthand connective tissue, but like epithelial tissue, you always give me the specific tissue type followed by the primary or basic tissue type because I want you to know that that's a type of connective tissue. So adipose CT or adipose connective tissue, we also call it fat. There are different variants of fat. We have white fat and brown fat, and they serve slightly different functional roles. But in general, what does adipose tissue do? Well, adipose tissue or fat, where is it found? It's found all over the body. It's found on top of the heart, surrounding organs, right, in the abdominal region, depending on male and female, and kind of the gluteal and mammary regions. And it serves a wide array of roles. What are those functional roles? Well, let's think about what fat does. It cushions and protects internal organs. It insulates your body and plays an important role in the regulation of temperature. It provides an energy reserve. So if you ever are low on energy reserves, for example, you haven't eaten for a little while, you're able to break down fat and use that to make ATP or energy. It stores lipid-soluble vitamins and minerals right? It locks things like organs, blood vessels, and nerves into place. So adipose tissue or fat serves a wide array of functional roles, and I hate that it gets demonized. If you have too much or too little of it, that can be problematic, but adipose tissue is important. It serves an important role. Now, when you look at adipose tissue, I think it looks kind of like marshmallows. You can go to imagine, you can use your imagination and think about whatever you want. I think it looks kind of like marshmallows. So when you're looking at this adipose tissue, each one of these cells you see here, so there's the nucleus of a cell, and then there's the cell. Adipose cells are kind of like sacks of triglycerides or sacks of fat. So you have the little nucleus over here and kind of like the all of this adipose tissue or tri, all of these triglycerides filling up the actual cytoplasm of the cell. They're kind of like sacks of fat. They're metabolically active sacks of fat, but they're sacks of fat nonetheless. So when you look at these guys here, what you're looking at is blood vessels running through the tissue. So you can actually see the red blood cells within those blood vessels. Now, if I was to ask you questions about this, of course, identify the specific tissue type indicated by the pointer. Where in the body would you find this tissue type? What are some functional roles of this tissue type? Those are your basic questions. Then to kind of elaborate on that, or to think about that, you have adipocytes. So if I was to say identify the specific cell type indicated by the pointer, that would be an adipocyte. And Filling up the adipocyte, you have these triglycerides. So if I said, what substance would you actually find in the, you know, in the cell itself? You could say triglycerides. Sorry, somebody is opening my garage, and I think it's my neighbor. So, in fact, I am pretty sure he is going to hit the jam, man. Because I let him use my thing for my jam. All right, so I'm going to head upstairs. Whoa, and I'm not going to edit this out because I don't care enough to... Oh, this room has baby stuff in it now. I forgot. Okay, so I'm going to come over here into my room. I have a three-day-old. He's currently out of, the, out of the casa. Okay. So, there we go. Now, identify the tissue. Identify the cell type. Give me functional roles. Tell me where you'd find it in the body. So let's go ahead and run through some questions on this particular image. Now, identify the tissue or specific tissue indicated on the image above. If this was a lab practical, or on the image on the screen, if this was a lab practical, you'd go, oh, okay, it looks kind of like marshmallows or whatever mental association you make, and you'd say, that's adipose connective tissue. You can put CT. 
Identify the cell type indicated by one. I'm not asking for the organelle for the nucleus of the cell. I'm asking you for the cell type. So even though it's pointing at the nucleus, it's pointing at the nucleus to emphasize the fact that it's offset a little bit. That nucleus is pushed to the side. And then in the cytoplasm, what you see here is just triglycerides. So you can't, they don't pick up stain very well. So light kind of passes right through those cells, but they're essentially sacks of fat. Now, when you look at it a little bit closer, you see why it's characterized as a connective tissue. All of this stuff out here is extracellular matrix, and those cells that are making that extracellular matrix that kind of bind those adipocytes together, th these cells here are the fibroblasts. So just think about the different types of questions that could come. The final type of loose connective tissue we're going over is reticular connective tissue. Where do you find it? You find it in soft organs such as the spleen, the lymph nodes, the kidneys, the liver, and bone marrow. And what it does is in soft organs, reticular connective tissue forms a scaffolding that holds the soft organ together. When you're looking at these fibers here, these fibers that f kind of form this network, so you can see them connecting in the, this kind of network, right? These are reticular fibers, and what they do is they form this network that perfuses through soft organs and it physically holds them together. It provides the scaffolding on which the functional cells of the soft organs sit. So when you think about like your spleen, that's a soft organ. If you didn't have reticular connective tissue permeating up through your spleen, your spleen would just dissolve out into a mush of cells. So it's a really important tissue. Now when you look at it, you have connective tissue and you have reticular connective tissue. I think it looks like a network. Other people think that the reticular fibers look kind of like lightning bolts. And I can see when people say that, I've heard that said by multiple students. So just think about being able to recognize this, being able to tell me where in the body you find it and what functional role it serves. Now, whereas we just talked about loose connective tissues, now we're gonna start talking about dense connective tissues. Unlike loose connective tissues, which are relatively malleable and kind of be distorted and you can change their shape, like if you grab the adipose tissue in your belly, you'll notice that it'll kind of deform or it'll morph and you can manipulate the shape of the tissue. Dense connective tissues, that doesn't really happen. There are two types of dense connective tissue that you need to know for this class. There's dense regular and dense irregular connective tissue. Dense regular connective tissue is made up of fibroblasts that secrete collagen fibers that run in parallel with one another, meaning in the same direction as one another. And where do you find it? You find it in tendons, ligaments, and sheets of connective tissue called aponeuroses. Now, I'll focus on tendons and ligaments here. So, tendons attach muscle to bone. Ligaments attach bone to bone, so you don't see any on this particular image. And when you think about how muscles generate movement, muscles physically pull bones around fixed points called joints. So when this muscle, the biceps brachii muscle, gets shorter, it pulls the radius and ulna around this fixed point called the elbow joint, and that's what produces flexion of your forearm. What makes up tendons and ligaments is dense regular connective tissue. Now, if you hear a written description of dense regular connective tissue, collagen fibers running in parallel when observed under the microscope takes on a wavy appearance. If I was to show you an image of dense regular connective tissue, what jumps out at you? It looks like waves. Some people tell me it looks like bacon, right? So it takes on this wavy appearance. If you see those waves, you know you're looking at dense regular connective tissue. These cells interspersed here are fibroblasts. Now, something I want you to note about dense regular connective tissue is it's a little bit different than most of the other connective tissues in the fact that it's avascular, meaning it doesn't have blood vessel networks. And the reason that things like tendon and ligament injuries are so difficult to heal or they don't heal quite as well as something like a broken bone is because tendons and ligaments are made of dense regular connective tissue and they don't have blood vessel networks. Anything without a blood vessel network, that's going to be a hard structure to heal because all of the healing factors are found in your blood. Now, when you think about dense regular connective tissue, makes up tendons and ligaments, has collagen fibers that run parallel or in the same direction as one another, 
Because all those collagen fibers run parallel, dense regular connective tissue has a lot of strength in one direction, right? So it can withstand a lot of strength or a lot of pull forces or tensile forces in one direction. The problem with that is, right, if you hit this dense regular connective tissue or stress it in a way that's not aligned with the fibers, so there's a force that actually goes against the direction these fibers are running and you can rip those tissues. So <coughs> identify the specific tissue indicated by the pointer. Where in the body would you find it? What's its function? It provides strong attachments for tendons and ligaments, right? So it allows bones to attach to bones and muscles to attach to bones, and it withstands a lot of force from one direction. Problem is, is if you hit that from a direction that it's not specifically intended for, it can tear the tissue. That's the problem with having all those fibers running in the same direction. Now, dense irregular connective tissue is a little bit different. So you still have densely packed collagen fibers and the tissue isn't super malleable. We refer to those collagen fibers rather than being in parallel with one another, they're irregularly arranged or they run in random directions. Fibroblasts are scattered all over the place. Where do you find it? Well, you find it in two places that I want you to know for this class. Three, you find it in the deep layer of the dermis of the skin, the deep layer, not the superficial, but the deep layer of the dermis is called the reticular layer of the dermis. So what actually forms most of the thickness of your skin is the reticular layer of the dermis, and the reticular layer of the dermis is formed from dense irregular connective tissue. You also find it in capsules surrounding organs and the perichondrium and the paraosteum, which are these membranes surrounding cartilage and bone. And it's unlike dense regular connective tissue, dense irregular connective tissue is crazy vascular, very, very highly vascular, meaning it has tons of blood vessels running up in it. Now, when you look at dense irregular connective tissue, I can give you the written description, which is collagen fibers irregularly arranged, tightly packed in order to provide structural integrity and tensile pull, you know, tensile strength from multiple directions, or however I decide to, um, you, you know, give you a written description. The image, what do you think this looks like? So all those pink things you're seeing in there are collagen fibers, and how are they running? They're not running all in one direction, they're running all over the place. All those little black dots, by the way, are fibroblasts. So you have these collagen fibers running all over the place. And this tissue isn't easily distorted. In fact, I often ask people, well, have you ever felt dense irregular connective tissue? And they're like, no, I've never felt it before. I think it's like, you know, like in the dermis of my skin. Everybody's probably felt it. Leather. Leather is dense irregular connective tissue. When you cure and process leather, right, the epithelial tissue is gone, the areolar connective tissue is gone, and what you're left with is dense irregular connective tissue. And why do we like leather? Well, leather is really durable, right? It's tough. It can withstand pull from multiple direction. It can protect your skin. Same thing with the dense irregular connective tissue. So when you look at it, I don't know what mental association you're going to make, whether it looks like marbled steak or cotton candy or whatever the hell you're going to say it looks like, but make your mental associations. This is the paraosteum, by the way. It's a network of connective tissue that surrounds the bones in your body. That's made from dense irregular connective tissue. So you find it in the deep layer or the reticular layer of the dermis and the capsules around organs and the connective tissue networks that surround bone and cartilage. Now... That's a good segue to cartilage. So we have cartilage connective tissue. Cartilage is formed from collagen fibers in the extracellular matrix in a very chondroitin sulfate rich extracellular matrix. So chondroitin sulfate is a type of ground substance. And unlike your loose connective tissues, there's a lot of ground substance in cartilage and that's why cartilage takes on kind of a defined three-dimensional shape. So <laughs> the chondroitin substance imparts resilience or gives it kind of its three-dimensional shape and prevents the tissue from uh, blowing apart. And the collagen kind of imparts internal strength and pull uh, strength in the tissue. It's kind of like rebar reinforcing the concrete. 
It's unique in the fact that it's largely avascular, so all cartilage is largely avascular and it relies on diffusion, so they're low oxygen tissues. Now, when we look at the cell types in cartilage, doesn't matter which of the three types of cartilage we're going over, cartilage cells are called chondrocytes. C-H-O-N-D means cartilage. O is a combining form in medical terminology, and site means cell. So chondrocytes are cartilage cells, and what they do is they don't make the extracellular matrix, but they maintain the extracellular matrix. Now, we, won't, we don't really get into cartilage growth quite yet. We do so a little bit in uh, when we start talking about the skeletal system, so I'll hold off on the producing of. Lacunae, on the other hand, are little lakes or these shallow depressions that in which cartilage cells sit. So cartilage cells like a little bit of space for themselves. I kind of think of lacunae as being like little cell apartments. So if I was a chondrocyte, this uh, room right here would be like my lacuna. Lacunae is plural. So there are three classifications that you need to be familiar with. Hyaline cartilage connective tissue, elastic cartilage connective tissue, and fibrocartilage cartilage connective tissue. What we're going to do is we're just going to look at those one by one, do. Hyaline cartilage connective tissue, most abundant type of cartilage in the body. Forms the end of long bones. Why? Because hyaline cartilage connective tissue is nice and smooth. And because we're going over the skeletal system in the next lecture, I want you to know that you find that hyaline cartilage connective tissue at the end of long bones because it's nice and smooth and it reduces friction at joints. You find it making up the anterior portion of the rib cage. We call them the costal cartilages. It surrounds structures like the respiratory tract, keeping those tubes open. When you are an embryo, meaning from week zero to week eight during gestational development, your entire skeletal system is essentially made of cartilage, and then that cartilage gets replaced with bone. And when you look at hyaline cartilage connective tissue, it takes on kind of a glassy appearance. It's nice. It's a nice, smooth tissue. So when you look at hyaline cartilage connective tissue, when I say hyaline cartilage connective tissue is found at the end of long bones, you have this specific structure associated with long bones called the articular cartilage, meaning the cartilage at the joint. And this articular cartilage, or this cartilage at the end of the long bones, reduces friction when bones are interacting with one another. So it has to be nice and smooth. You don't want to damage that cartilage, because cartilage, just like dense regular connective tissue. It's largely avascular, so it doesn't heal quite as well as very vascular tissues do. Now remember, those are the only exceptions. For the most part, connective tissues are vascular, but I'm giving you the exceptions as we go through. Now when you look at cartilage, you have cells interspersed filled in with extracellular matrix, and it's the extracellular matrix that makes up most of the tissue. A lot of ground substance in there. That's why it takes on a three di defined three-dimensional shape. The specific type of ground substance is called chondroitin sulfate. Now let's go through the questions. ID the specific or the tissue indicated by the pointer. Hyaline cartilage CT or connective tissue. Where in the body would you find it? At the end of long bones making up the anterior portion of the rib cage supporting the respiratory tract. What's its function? It's a strong tissue but it's also nice and smooth so it can reduce friction at joints takes on this smooth glassy appearance. If I was to ask you, identify the cell type indicated by the pointer. Each one of these cells is called a chondrocyte, right? So identify the cell type indicated by the pointer. Those would be chondrocytes. Identify the structure. Chondrocytes exist within little hollow depressions or like little cell apartments, and these little apartments for cells are called lacuna, right? Lacuna singular, lacunae with an E at the end, plurally. So those are the types of questions that you get asked. Identify the tissue indicated by one, or the specific tissue indicated by one. Identify the cell type indicated by three. Identify the structure indicated by two. Make sure to read the question carefully before answering the question. Elastic cartilage connective tissue. So you find it elastic cartilage connective tissue, which is a different type of cartilage than hyaline cartilage connective tissue in two places in the body. You find it in the external structures of the ear, and you find it in a structure that folds over your airway when you're breathing called your epiglottis. Now I'm about to blow your mind. Take a look. That's my ear. I'm gonna stretch it and then BOOM! 
it goes back to its original shape. Why does it do that? Because it has elastic fibers perfused through it, and those elastic fibers, right, allow the tissue to be distorted and then return to its initial shape, and that's why it's called elastic cartilage connective tissue. Now, when you think about elastic cartilage connective tissue, here are a couple different histological images. I think it looks kind of like mossy rocks. Other people have different mental associations. So you have chondrocytes in the lacuna, but what I'm going to focus on for the exam is can you distinguish that elastic cartilage connective tissue from hyaline cartilage connective tissue? You always can because the extracellular matrix of elastic cartilage connective tissue is always going to be richly perfused with these dark staining fibers right here. All of these fibers that you see in here that form kind of almost like a, a spider web like matrix, all of those are elastic fibers. And that's what gives the tissue its elasticity characteristics. So when you look at the fibers over here, every single one of those fibers is elastic fibers running through, right? And again, they're capable of stretching and returning to their initial shape, and that's why we call it elastic cartilage connective tissue. Compare that to hyaline cartilage connective tissue. Do you see any of those kind of darkly staining or black elastic fibers running through? <clears throat> now, fibrocartilage connective tissue, I rarely give you color cues, right? Because a lot of times you have to recognize these in black and white, especially if you're taking it in a <clears throat> traditional uh, classroom setting. But here I'm going to. So fibrocartilage connective tissue is a little bit different. It's really, really good at withstanding compression forces, meaning it's really good at, uh, it's a weight bearing tissue that's just very good at withstanding compression. Now, when you look at fibrocartilage connective tissue, the collagen fibers that run through that tissue tend to pick up blue and purple and teal stains and turquoise stains really well. So if you see a really blue tissue like this, kind of with those wispy collagen fibers running through, that's fibrocartilage connective tissue. So here are your chondrocytes, your lacunae, and then you have all of these collagen fibers, and when they pick up that blue stain like that or that teal stain like that, you're looking at fibrocartilage connective tissue. Where do you find fibrocartilage connective tissue? Well, two places that I want you to know. Three. But the first one, and the one I really want you to know for right now, are the intervertebral discs. So the intervertebral discs are the little discs in between each of your vertebrae. And because your, the weight of your body, right, is you're constantly exposing these discs to the weight of your body. So they're exposed to a lot of force all the time, compression force, because they carry the weight of your body when you think about uh, what the vertebrae is actually doing. So you have to, if these bones were just rubbing together, they would damage one another. So you need these little discs in between each of the vertebrae, and these discs, which are made predominantly from fibrocartilage connective tissue or fibrocartilage CT, are really good at withstanding compression forces. Really, really good. So you have fibrocartilage connective tissue. Other place you find them are the pads in the knee called the meniscus. And the anterior portion of the pelvis is latched together by fibrocartilage connective tissue. We call it the pubic symphysis. So intervertebral disc, that's the big one. And it's important to note that the intervertebral disc contribute a lot to your overall height. So as you get older and as that fibrocartilage loses water and gets, you know, as being consistently or constantly compressed, those intervertebral discs flatten out a little bit and you can lose a little bit of your height. On the flip token, if you go to, you know, space in a reduced gravity environment, right, and you're floating around and there's no gravity pulling down, so there's no compression forces on those intervertebral discs, they can kind of balloon out and people can get taller. In fact, when you get back from a space mission, you can be two inches taller. So I should go to space probably at some point in my life, all right? Am I right? You guys can't see me because it's an online class probably, so you can't see how tall I am. Whatever. All right, so structural connective tissue, bone connective tissue. Bone connective tissue has a very hard extracellular matrix perfused with calcium salts and collagen fiber. The calcium salts make that bone hard. It's dynamic. It can withstand compression forces. It has flexibility because of those collagen fibers. Bone is very vascular. It heals so well because it's very, very vascular, meaning it has lots of blood vessels. 
and let's go ahead and look at it. So it provides kind of the structural framework for the body. Again, we're having our skeletal system section pretty soon, so I'm not going to trend too far into bone. But there are two types of bone. There's compact bone connective tissue, which makes up like the shaft of long bones, like the humerus, the radius, the ulna, uh, the femur, the tibia, the fibula. And it makes up the external portions of things like flat, irregular bones, short bones. As the name implies, compact bone connective tissue is compact and really hard, right? It has a lot of compression strength, or it's hard. And when you look at it very, very up close, compact bone connective tissue is organized into these repeating units of structures called osteons. So what you're looking at here, the structure that almost looks like a bullseye or a tree trunk, is a column within that compact bone connective tissue called an osteon. Now compact bone connective tissue itself is made up from many hundreds to thousands to millions of osteons depending on the bone. Osteons are these small repeating column units that almost look like bullseyes or tree trunks. So if I was to put a bracket around this and ask you to identify the structure indicated by the bracket for right now, I would say an osteon, O-S-T-O-N. If you see an osteon, this kind of bullseye structure, you know it's compact bone connective tissue, not spongy bone connective tissue. Now, here we have lacunae, these hollow little depressions, so bone cells like to be in their own little space. And within those lacunae, in a living uh, bone, because this is dead, dried ground bone, so those osteocytes have already been baked out, but there would be a cell type called an osteocyte. Now, running through the middle of each one of these osteons is what's called the central canal. The central canal houses blood vessels and nerves, so bone is very well vascularized and well innervated. When you look at bone connective tissue, here we have the osteon. It's also called the haversian system to pay homage to the scientists. Don't worry about that. Here you have your osteon, here you have your central canal. Through the central canal runs blood vessels. Because compact bone and bones in general, when you think about like the shaft or your long bones, is made up from many hundreds uh, to thousands to whatever number of osteons, not only is bone vascular, but bone is very, very, very vascular. Now, spongy bone connective tissue, you can see the transition at a macroscopic level between compact bone connective tissue, which forms the shaft, and we're looking at the femur here of the femur, which is a long bone. The end of long bones is formed or composed predominantly of what's called spongy bone connective tissue. So you can just see the difference between compact and spongy bone. I probably don't have to iterate. Spongy bone looks kind of like a sponge. It has all these little nooks and crannies, right? And in those little nooks and crannies, there's a substance that exists called red bone marrow. The bone part of those little nooks and crannies, the actual bone structure, those bone pieces are called trabeculae, and they form like finger-like networks with all these little nooks and crannies in which uh, red bone marrow exists. So when you look at compact bone histologically, here forming the internal component of the parietal bone, which is a flat bone, you have spongy bone connective tissue. Now you see all those little nooks and crannies or pores and within all those little nooks or, and crannies or pores what you see are stem cells and these stem cells are actually what's called red bone marrow. So you, red bone marrow is always found in spongy bone connective tissue. Histologically it looks nothing like uh, compact bone connective tissue and every one of these little projections you see Here's a trabeculae, here's a trabeculae, here's a trabeculae. Each one of those kind of like finger-like projections is what's called a trabeculae. So if you see osteons, that's compact bone connective tissue. If you see trabeculae, that's spongy bone connective tissue. Models in the lab and the types of questions you'd expect on a lab practical are things like this. Now, for right now, you just have to say, if I said identify the specific tissue, compact bone connective tissue, why do you call it that? What's an anatomical justification? Well, you have these osteons. That's what's indicated by the bracket called uh, labeled 2 there. And running through each osteon is a central canal. And in that central canal, you find blood vessels. So not only is bone vascular, it's very, very vascular. And these osteons are kind of like columns. 
kind of like tying logs together and it does a lot of things for bone that we're going to talk about when we get to the skeletal system. So for right now that's about all you really need to know. Now blood connective tissue. Yes, blood is a type of connective tissue. Blood plasma is the extracellular matrix and then in that blood plasma which composes most of the tissue you find cells. We refer to blood cells or the cellular components of blood as being formed elements. So red blood cells, aka erythrocytes, are the formed elements that carry oxygen throughout the body. White blood cells, aka leukocytes, L-E-U-K-O-C-Y-T-E, are the cells that mediate immune defenses. Leuco means white, cyte means cell. And platelets, aka thrombocytes, T-H-R-O-M-B-O-C-Y-T-E, thrombocyte, Platelets are little cell fragments that facilitate blood clotting. These are the cellular components of bone or what we call the formed element. So if I ask you to identify a formed element, I'm asking for a red blood cell, white blood cell, or a platelet. The extracellular matrix of blood is called blood plasma. And it's this aqueous solution, meaning water-based solution, that has tons of proteins and organic and inorganic solutes that we think of as being nutrients in it. And when you think about what blood does, blood is the fluid that transports material throughout our body. Transports gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide, nutrients, chemical messengers like hormones, immune cells to areas that are subject to or actively um, invaded by some infectious agent. So it's a transport mechanism. How do we get nutrients and oxygen to the cells of our tissue? We transport it in the blood. How do we get rid of, rid of metabolic waste and carbon dioxide? We transport it in the blood. Now, when you think about the cardiovascular system, you have the heart and it pumps blood through a series of blood vessels we call arteries, veins, and capillaries, which we'll get into at a later point. When you think about the fluid that's being pumped through your cardiovascular system, when you look at it up close, if I was to say identify the tissue indicated by the pointer, so you see these cells that kind of look almost like they're shaped like inner tubes interspersed with these gigantic dark staining cells. What you're looking at out here is blood plasma, right? What you're looking at here is a red blood cell and what you're looking at here is a white blood cell. Don't try and get technical yet. Don't say neutrophil because you've studied ahead, because then you introduce the potential for error that doesn't need to be there for this first exam. It's just a leukocyte or a white blood cell. So identify the tissue indicated by the pointer, right? Blood connective tissue or blood CT. Where in the body would you find it? In your cardiovascular system. What's its function? Transports nutrients, gases, and wastes around the body, right? It transports everything that the body moves. And then if I followed up with identify the formed element indicated by the pointer, these most abundant of the formed elements, which can compose anywhere from 37 to 50 percent of whole blood, these formed elements here are called red blood cells. Their job is to move oxygen around. This formed element here, which is larger and stains darker, is called a white blood cell. Now it's a neutrophil, but don't worry about that yet. Just call it a white blood cell or a leukocyte. What's its job? It mediates immune responses, meaning it targets infections for death. Now when you look at blood at a lower magnification, right, you can see the red blood cells, the white blood cells, different types. Don't worry about the specific types yet. And each one of these little things right here that look like little dots, those are platelets, right? So platelets facilitate blood clotting pathways. They're also called thrombocytes. Thrombo means clotting, site means cell. So think about it on this image. Identify the formed element, identify the formed element, identify the formed element. We're looking at white blood cells, red blood cells, and doop, 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 platelets. All right, thanks a lot, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks for being so good.